In October of 2008, on an obscure, anonymous mailing list called the Cypherpunk mailing list, an anonymous participant using the pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto announced the publication of a paper and said, I think I have solved a problem in computer science. I have found a way to create a system of electronic cash that is direct between people, peer to peer, as we use the term in computer science. In this system of electronic cash, I have written a white paper and I have implemented it in software. And on that day, Satoshi Nakamoto published the white paper. You can download it online. Uh, it's available at bitcoin.org. Um, you can do a search for it, the Satoshi Nakamoto white paper or the Bitcoin white paper. And in nine pages, Satoshi Nakamoto described in detail and in ways that predicted many of the things that happened over the next seven years what Bitcoin was, and what Bitcoin could become, and how it would work. But he didn't stop there. Or she didn't stop there. Or they didn't stop there, because we don't know if Satoshi Nakamoto is a man, a woman, or a group of people. Or an alien being from the future. Okay, probably not that last one. Satoshi Nakamoto then published software and invited people to participate in running a network. And this gives you the first hint as to how Bitcoin works. Bitcoin is software. Bitcoin is an application, among other things. You download this application, you run it on your computer. You can run it on a laptop, you can run it on a desktop. Preferably on a computer that's permanently connected to the internet. It uses quite a bit of RAM and disk space right now. But in those days it was very lightweight. And if you run this program, it reaches out on the internet and it finds other people running this program. You don't know who these people are. It doesn't reach out to specific people. It creates a random mesh network, what we call a peer-to-peer -peer network, where every participant in the system is equal. There is no special computer. They're all just talking to each other. It creates what in network terms we call a cloud. So randomly reaches out and connects to various other computers running the Bitcoin software, and together they create a network. And that network is used to exchange and propagate transactions. And these transactions are encoded in a digital format. They contain information about the transfer of value and the authorization to transfer value between participants. Nobody controls this network. And this is a critical concept. Nobody controls this network. You can be running one of these computers. You do not control this network. You run one of these applications. It connects to other people. And you run another one of these applications. And it talks Bitcoin to the other computers that are talking Bitcoin. But no one is in control. No one is in charge. Just like when you're running a computer that speaks on the internet and communicates with other computers on the internet, no one is in control. If you interact directly between these systems. That network started on January 3rd, 2009. And on that day, the world changed. For the first time in the history of money, in the history of trust, in the history of institutions, in the history of humanity, 
a system that is completely independent of authority, is completely independent of institutions, a system that develops trust as the result of collaboration, communication, and computation through cryptography was born. This system allows people to exchange value, to transmit money. And this money is called Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is the application. It's the software that you run on your computer that communicates with all of the other computers running the Bitcoin software. Bitcoin is the name of the network that runs the Bitcoin network, which is the collection of all of these computers. Some six and a half thousand of them around the world, anywhere there is internet, are the ones we know that advertise their presence, several thousand more that don't, and tens of thousands that simply listen onto this network without actively participating in the Bitcoin network. And all of this is an infrastructure that is used to create and transmit value in the form of transactions expressed in a new currency, the Bitcoin currency. And the Bitcoin currency is unlike any other form of money we have ever seen before. First of all, as a form of money, it does not exist in physical form. It is the culmination of a trajectory we've seen in human history. Over thousands of years, money has become a more abstract form of value. You start with very, very tangible forms of value. Commodities. A goat. A banana. A pineapple. These are very poor forms of money, because you can eat them, and they rot or die, and they can be lost. They're not very good forms of money, because they are the thing of value. We went from that to gold, precious metals, and stamped coins. These are better forms of money, because you cannot eat them. They do not die or rot. They do not represent the value itself. They are not the value. And this is an interesting concept. Money is not the valuable thing itself. Money is the thing you exchange for the valuable thing itself. The reason bananas are not good money is because bananas are the value you're trying to get. Money is the thing you exchange for bananas that has no value in itself. It is simply a symbol, an abstraction. It represents something that can be carried that I can give to someone tomorrow, and they will probably give me bananas. That future promise of value is the essence of money. So the essence of money is the ability to have an abstract token that in itself is immutable, unforgeable, eternal, maintains its value, and represents the exchange of value in the future as a promise. And over time, these things have become less and less physical and more and more abstract. Why? Because people don't like changing. And if you tell someone, I'm not going to give you bananas for the work you did. I'm going to give you a shiny gold coin, but don't worry, you can use this to get bananas. They look at you and they say, I've always had bananas for my work. I think I would like to have bananas, not this yellow thing. A hundred years later, they now believe the yellow thing is valuable. And then you tell them, now I'm going to give you a piece of paper instead of the yellow thing, but don't worry, you can still convert this into bananas, and most people say, I don't think that's real money. I want the yellow thing, and the world moves on. And eventually we change, and we say, you know what? You won't get the piece of paper either. 
you won't get the coin. You will go and look at numbers on a page or on a web page. And that represents the amount you have in the bank. But don't worry, you can still use that to acquire food, products, services. It really is money. You can't touch it. You can't see it. It's just a number. And finally, we arrive at Bitcoin. Bitcoin has no physical form. It doesn't exist in any way. It is entirely intangible. It cannot be touched. It is simply a digital form of money. But it is a digital form of money that is entirely different from everything we've seen before. What it does that is different is that it is not a form of money that is recorded in the database or records of a company. It is not a digital form of money that represents a debt owed to a central bank or government. It is not a digital form of money that has been issued by a sovereign, a central bank, a nation, a king. It is a form of digital money that has been issued through complex and energy-intensive computation on the internet, is recorded simultaneously on every computer that participates in the Bitcoin network, is validated independently by every computer that participates in the Bitcoin network, cannot be forged, cannot be counterfeited, cannot be censored, cannot be seized or frozen, can be transmitted anywhere in the world as information, can be verified independently by anyone who receives it, and is not controlled by anyone. Its value is not controlled, its issuance is not controlled, its ownership is not controlled. It is direct from one person to another person. What's going on with this like huge rise from $20 way up into the hundreds and then a precipitous fall yesterday? Well, let's remember that until yesterday, most people around the world never heard of Bitcoin. Bitcoin, for those who don't know it, is basically virtual currency, the same that you get for blasting aliens in a video game, except now traded globally. You can buy Bitcoins with virtually any currency on Earth and convert back into any currency or buy goods and services well, with Well, we it. talked about the story. What really got us talking about Bitcoin was the guy in Edmonton who was selling his house for the first time wanted 400,000 in bitcoins. So uh, I think the, the best way to look at this, this is a proxy for the mistrust individuals have of central bankers. If you're willing to take bitcoin as a currency, virtual Barbie currency to me, uh, it, it, it has no basis, no central banker, no hard asset behind it. But if you don't trust any other currency, this is where you go. So it is essentially what's happening here, Heather, people all around the world are saying, I've had it with my central banker. I don't trust politicians anymore. I'm going to trade with this currency with my computer and my cell phone. Well, they did that. The reason the Bitcoin shot up was after Cyprus, when they thought the government was going to get the hands on sure. the money in the bank. So people turned to Bitcoins to keep them protected. So I ignore everything until it gets to a billion dollars of market cap. Okay. That happened recently with Bitcoin, well over a billion in value. So it's here to stay. When you've accumulated a virtual worth of a billion dollars and people are willing to trade it and actually buy things with it, turn it back into hard assets. And here's the key, Heather. Owners of hard assets are willing to take Bitcoin. This is here to stay. That's what's going to happen. And no central bank can control it. But you just called it a Barbie currency. I was going to say, is it all hocus pocus? I mean, is it a legitimate form of currency to trade? It is. And as soon as it passed a billion and someone bought a hard asset with it, in right. my books, as an investor, it became real. Now, at the same time, because relative to all other currencies, it's tiny. A billion dollars is irrelevant in the currency market. Remember, the currency markets are the largest markets on Earth, bigger than commodities, bigger than stocks, bigger than bonds. It's going to grow, but it's going to take a long time. But the key is volatility. You, no, nobody's going to put a large part of their net worth into this thing because it can go up to down to 60% in a day, as we saw yesterday. But is it here to stay? Oh, yeah. So will I take 2 or 3% in Bitcoins? I think I might. I'm going to start looking at it. Are you really? I was going to say, are you into this at all? I have a basket of currencies, Heather. The way you diversify your risk in currencies is to own many of them. I own euros, I own Swiss francs, I own Canadian dollars, American dollars. And I might start to dabble 
a little dabble do you, Bitcoin. <laughs> That's exactly what I was going to say. All right, thank you for the primer, Kevin O'Leary, our business commentator, the chair of O'Leary Funds. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, well, uh, Commissioner, um, Mr. President, uh, I rise again, I'm afraid, to make the same old hoary speech that I've been making here for several years. And that is, it is my opinion that you do not really understand the concept of banking. All the banks are broke. Uh, Bank Santander, Deutsche Bank, Royal Bank of Scotland, they're all broke. And why are they broke? It isn't an act of God. It isn't some sort of tsunami. They're broke because we have a system called fractional reserve banking, which means that banks can lend money that they don't actually have. It's a criminal scandal, and it's been going on for too long. To add to that problem, you have moral hazard, a very significant moral hazard from the political sphere. And most of the problem starts in politics and central banks, which are part of the same political system. We have counterfeiting, sometimes called quantitative easing, but counterfeiting by an, any other name. The artificial printing of money, which if any ordinary person did, they'd go to prison for a very long time. And yet governments and central banks do it all the time. Central banks repress the amount of interest that rate, rates are, so we don't have the real cost of money. And yet we blame the real retail banks for manipulating LIBOR. The sheer effrontery of this is quite astonishing. It's central banks. It's central banks that manipulate interest rates, Commissioner. And plus, underneath all this, we talk loosely, in a rather cavalier fashion, do we not, about deposit guarantees. So when banks go broke through their own incompetence and chicanery, the taxpayer picks up the tab. It's theft from the taxpayer. And until we start sending bankers, and I include central bankers and politicians, to prison for this outrage, it will continue. Well, we're going to be negative for a long time. Uh, you, better, you better own equities. Or you better own something other than, than, than that. I mean, it, it, it's remarkable what's happened in the last 10 years. I've been wrong in thinking that, that you could... Uh, really have the developments you've had uh, without inflation taking hold. But uh, we have 120 odd billion. Well, we have some almost very high percentage in treasury bills, some in other, and some just in cash. But we, but those treasury bills are paying us virtually nothing. Now, they're a terrible investment over time, but they are the one thing that when opportunity arises, it will arise at a time, and maybe the only thing you can look to to pay for those opportunities is the Treasury bill you have, and the rest of the world may have stopped. And we also need them to protect, be sure that we can pay the liabilities we have in terms of policyholders over time, and we take that very seriously. Uh, so if the world turns into a world where you can issue more and more money and have negative interest rates over time. Uh, well, I'd have to see it to believe it, but I've seen a little bit of it. I've been surprised, so I, I've been wrong so far. Uh, I do not think that... Uh, uh, I don't see how you can uh, create... Uh, I would say this. If you can have negative interest rates and pour out money and incur more and more debt relative to productive capacity, you'd think the world would have discovered it in the first couple thousand years rather than just coming on it now, but we will see. It's, a, it's, one of the it's probably the most interesting question I've ever seen in economics is, is, uh, is uh, can you keep doing what we're doing now? And, and uh, we've been able to do it, or the world's been able to do it for now. A dozen years or so, and but we're we may be facing a we may be facing a period where we're testing that hypothesis that you can continue it uh, with a lot more force than we've tested it before. I'd like to get rid of the Federal Reserve too. I would like to have money controlled by a computer. However, that's not what's happening, and I'm a realist. <laughs> You're going to have a Federal Reserve system. And therefore, it's relevant to ask, given that there is a Federal Reserve System, even though it would be a better world if we could get rid of them, 
how should Federal Reserve operate? Simply flooded the system with money. Yes, we did. That's another way to think about it. We did. Where does it come from? Do you just print it? We print it digitally. So we, you know, we, as a central bank, we have the ability to create money uh, digitally. And we do that by buying treasury bills or, or bonds or other government guaranteed securities. And that, that actually increases the money supply. We also print actual currency and we distribute that through the Federal Reserve Bank. Is that part of way? A person who what really about, understands the about, of cars? What about an attack? An attack? What kind of attack? Like... Like the, you the think about, you think about, no, you think about, you pull out your debit card, right? Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, no one's debit card works. Oh, yeah, right? What's going to stop that from happening? What do you do with no money? Because mm. there's only 3% that's real cash. That's real, like, palpable. So if everybody wanted money. all the paper for all the money they have in the bank, we would never be able to do it. If, if everybody's debit card stopped working, it would fucking... How much cash is there out there, right? I have no idea. But like, how much cash is there out there now in comparison to, like, the 80s when there was only cash? It's it probably, the same, the, same cash it's probably the same amount. But most people use credit cards now, right? Like, way more. Yeah, but think about if, if we had an enemy that wanted to yeah. say... No or cash. even or or even our own government that's just like mm, all technology monetary wise is cut off yeah they just killed the system they just stopped it all no more banks no more banking no more atms what are you gonna do you don't have any money you don't it's have all, nobody has up. any money you can't buy food you can't buy anything so you have to steal and then all your money everything is up Chairman Crapo, Ranking Member Brown, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Peter Van Valkenburg, and I'm the Director of Research at Coin Center, an independent nonprofit focused on the public policy issues affecting cryptocurrency and public blockchain networks. What is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is the world's first cryptocurrency, and it works because of the world's first public blockchain network. What does Bitcoin do? It's simple. It lets you send and receive value to and from anyone in the world using nothing more than a computer and an internet connection. Now, why is it revolutionary? Because unlike every other tool for sending money over the internet, it works without the need to trust a middleman. The lack of any corporation in between means that Bitcoin is the world's first public digital payments infrastructure. And by public, I simply mean available to all and not owned by any single entity. Now, we have public infrastructure for information, for websites, for email. It's called the internet. But the only public payments infrastructure that we have is cash, as in paper money. And it only works in face-to-face -face transactions. Before Bitcoin, if you wanted to pay someone remotely over the phone or the internet, then you could not use public infrastructure. You would rely on a private bank to open their books and add a ledger entry that debits you and credits the person you're paying. And if you both don't use the same bank, well, then there'll be multiple banks and multiple ledger entries in between. With Bitcoin, the ledger is the public blockchain and anyone can add an entry to that ledger, transferring their Bitcoins to someone else. And anyone, regardless of their nationality, race, religion, gender, sex, or creditworthiness, can for absolutely no cost create a Bitcoin address in order to receive payments digitally. Bitcoin is the world's first globally accessible public money. Is it perfect? No. Neither was email when it was invented in 1972. Bitcoin's not the best money on every margin. Uh, it's not yet accepted everywhere. It's not used often to quote prices, and it's not always a stable store of value. But it is working, and the mere fact that it works without trusted intermediaries is amazing. It's a computer science breakthrough, and it will be as significant for freedom, prosperity, and human flourishing as the birth of the internet. 
So children being born today will not use paper or metal money. We have to think about what kind of cashless society do you want to live in? Do you want your children to live in? Think about when you buy something uh, from a corner store with cash. The merchant does not know your name, your address, what the last thing you bought, maybe what you're most likely to buy next. And you know what? They didn't need to know any of that. That was fine. But now this is being taken away from us by corporations and governments who insist that for our security, they need to know everything about us. I think this is nonsense, and I think we need to fight back. And thankfully, about a decade ago, someone, some group of people came up with a way out. If you look at the evolution of money from when we used to have a barter system through shells, through precious metals, through precious metals stamped with king's faces on them, to paper money, and now to credit cards and mobile payments, someone created another way to have a money system without a central authority, and that is Bitcoin. We think about the way digital payments work today, and again, all payments will be digital. There's a third party in the middle, whether it's Visa, Venmo, PayPal, WeChat. Someone in the middle can freeze your transaction, confiscate your funds, surveil and spy on you. With Bitcoin, your transaction is completely peer-to-peer. -peer. The payment processing is done by a decentralized global competition and not by an entity. The last six months have been weird um, for all of us. And we watched this incredible run-up in the price, and it dominated the conversation. Now, if you've been in this space for a while, this isn't new to you, right? You've seen this happen. This is maybe the sixth, seventh, maybe eighth big bubble-like behavior where you see this massive increase in price. And we've seen it before. I remember at some point in October, I started getting calls from journalists, and they asked me to comment on this. And they would ask in a very kind of cagey way, so what do you think? Could this possibly maybe be a bubble? I was like, of course it's a bubble. We're living in the era of the everything bubble. But really, it's not the Bitcoin bubble you should be worried about that everybody is very aware of. I'd be more worried about the subprime auto loan bubble, the stock bubble, the bond bubble, the real estate bubble, the student loan bubble, the debt bubble, the foreign exchange bubble, the fang bubble, the tech bubble, the everything bubble. I think many of you have probably had this experience. You come into this space, you don't know what's going on. It's all very, very weird and it's complicated and difficult to understand. You find someone who can explain something to you, and you start barely understanding some of the things around you. And then you suddenly realize that even though you are quite aware you don't know or in the related space, the entire cryptocurrency space. To everyone you know, you're the expert. <laughs> and they come to you and they go, you know about Bitcoin. Should I invest in IOTA? <laughs> or you know about Bitcoin, is this a good time to get in? And maybe you told them when the price was, I don't know, 200, and they ignored you because they thought it was silly internet money. But the morning that it hits 19,000, they call you up and they go, is this a good time to get in? And depending on whether they're a good friend, in which case you say, hell no, Wait, or they're that douchebag who bullied you in high school, in which case you're like, yeah, now's the time to get in, Chad. <laughs> you wouldn't do that, of course. Everyone in this theater is wonderful. We wouldn't do that. But the best part, after you told them to get in at 200 and they ignored you and they called you up at 19,000. In January and February, you start getting the calls. I know you've had them where someone calls you up and they go, Are you okay? 
I saw on CNBC that Bitcoin crashed. It's, it's destroyed, it's gone, it's down in the doldrums, it's a mess. Are you okay? Now, let's not minimize the fact that a lot of people who did get in at 19,000, probably in a very ill-advised way, are hurting. And that's not funny. That's bad investment decisions, and you should be very, very careful. These things are extremely volatile. But it is extremely ironic when people call you up and they go, "Are you okay?" Because we heard it crashed a year ago. We were just over a thousand. So price-wise, we're up a cool 800 percent. So your answer should probably be, you're in S&P index funds. Are you okay? Because the day I start hearing about your investment on TV, you won't be okay. Nobody will be okay. And so you see, even my talk here, dominated by price, not something you hear me talk about a lot, but it's apropos, it's the times we're in. And then suddenly, the price tanks, the meetups start getting roomy again, the phone calls stop, some people start laughing at you again. Because they're like, I told you it was crazy magic, magic internet money that would crash. And the cycle repeats. Do you guys like farmer's markets? Anybody here like farmer's market? If you go to a farmer's market this weekend, they're going to have two things. Rhubarb and pumpkins. Because it's winter. <laughs> and you're not going to find a great array of beautiful organic vegetables. Those come from Mexico at this time of the year. The farmers, the local farmers market, all they can deliver at this time of year is rhubarb. And in a great analogy to the economic situation we're in. If you went to the farmer's market right now and notice it's not very popular and there aren't too many people there, you might go, huh, farming is dead. I knew it. I saw it on CNBC. Now, let me just basically say how impressed I am with Ethereum, you know, full stop, period. Uh, and that when I think about this as a regulator, you know, I think of it almost uh, analogized to email versus the internet. If Bitcoin is email, you know, a one-trick pony, so to speak, but obviously revolutionary, Ethereum goes far beyond that. It's more like the internet. The stock market, you know, you say it always goes up. It's like that 45 degree angle. Correct. Since 1971, direct 45 degree angle, a couple of drops, whatever, was straight up. That's because it's denominated in dollars. They're just devaluing the dollar, right? right. Stocks go up. If you denominate that same stock market in gold, the stock market is down since 1970. It's all, the stock market is a complete scam in terms of accruing value. It's all the dollar being done. So it goes straight up 45 degree angle, but if you denominate it in ounces of gold, it's dead. Okay. So, okay. Well, here, no, here's why, here's why it's important. You go to buying gold. No, here's why it's important. Uh, you bought a house, right? In, uh, where? Uh, a lot of places. <laughs> Nantucket? <laughs> yeah, I have one there, yes. <laughs> okay. Why'd you buy that house in Nantucket? I love that place. Okay. I, I mean, I love it. That, that's not something I was trying to get. Like, I thought lived in the rest of my life. Okay. And there wasn't that many to select from, right? right? Yes. Okay. And because there's not that many, the prices are expensive, and right. you have a lot of money, so you could buy it. Right, yes. Okay. Same thing in the digital world is there's some things that are just scarce. And if those things end up having a large community that wants them, what ends up happening? Price goes up. Go up, correct. Okay. So Bitcoin's only got 21 million, obviously. And the whole thing behind it is the strongest computing power in the world. So literally the computer network that runs Bitcoin is stronger than anything in the world. No government, nobody can hack it because it is the strongest computing network in the world. It's got more computing power on it than anything else. So rather than the government saying, 
uh, hey, today we're going to print more money. Or we'll remember what happened today with Penn, where they just all of a sudden, all these new shares, right? Yep. You, you're like, fuck, what the hell? Like, I had no say in this. Right. That's basically what the Federal Reserve does. So earlier this year, they printed three plus trillion dollars. You didn't get a vote. I didn't get a vote. It was fuck. Okay. Whatever cash you have is going to be worth less next year, right? Because the purchasing power goes right. down. And so what ends up happening is you're financially incentivized to get out of the dollar and buy stocks, buy gold, buy, you know, buy fucking property, whatever. But with Bitcoin, they can't do that. The reason why it becomes so valuable is because nobody can fuck with it. And that's why the Bitcoiners are so like rabid about it. Is they're just like, look, it doesn't matter what anybody says, what you think, I think, anybody. Nobody can fuck with it. Uh, well, um, I'm a baby boomer. I was born just after the war. Uh, we've had probably, we've probably uh, had the longest period of peace and prosperity uh, globally. Uh, I would say uh, from that time. I've put a little bit of modest money away so I can hand something down to my family when I pass on. Largely because I've never spent more money than I've earned, and I've been prudent, and I've worked moderately hard. Now it always seems to me as a complete surprise to politicians how countries get in debt. Let me explain, because I don't think you really understand it. It's because politicians consistently spend more money than they raise in taxation, more money than they can possibly raise in taxation, most of which, in point of fact, they actually waste. The reason we're talking about countries which are broke, and they are broke, is because they're ridiculous, ineffective, ignorant politicians consistently spend more money than they can raise, and then they borrow and they borrow, and worse, they then print money because politicians and their central banks have a machine which prints money. You do that as a private citizen and it's a criminal offence. You would go to prison for doing that and politicians and their central banks do it all the time. Let me explain to you that these countries are broke and they're broke because of their own stupid leadership and politicians and it's immoral, immoral to ask ordinary taxpayers of any country to pick up the tab for failed politicians and failed banks. They are defaulted, they're broke. For God's sake, let's all of us admit it. Institutional buy-in, at least intellectually, but do you still not have to ask the question, why? Uh, what, what problem is it solving that other assets or currencies uh, or commodities can't? Yeah, listen, it's it's scarcity. It is, it is as old as the first currencies, you know. How do I store my value? And people are worried that our governments, who have printed more and more and more fiat, uh, are less trustworthy, right? You see what happened in places like Zimbabwe or Weimar, Germany. There's a hundred examples of currencies debasing, uh, governments debasing their currency uh, to oblivion. Uh, but even you know, something like, you know, the pound sterling, right? Like, if you think about the pound sterling, used to buy you a pound of sterling. And now it buys you about this much sterling. And so there's been this long debasement even of, of, a, of a, a stable currency. And so people are going to Bitcoin because there are 21 million Bitcoins that'll ever be mined. There's a complete scarcity in it. People believe it's a store of value, right? It's a social construct, yeah. and you can't change that. So let me ask you, though, about that correlation, because because with risk on, people are taking uh, more uh, more bets on things like Bitcoin. But how much of that is a bet on a bet on Bitcoin or, or the issues around just printing cash versus the the operational potential as a transactional currency? Given the news we just heard from PayPal that PayPal is going to allow cryptocurrencies as part of the wallet. How does that change yeah. this? I think that's, you know, the, in some ways the shot heard around the world on Wall Street, right? PayPal has 346 million accounts, right? They're the 30th biggest bank in the U.S. in deposits. And all of a sudden, every financial institution says, wait a minute, what do I'm doing? And so if you're at the boardroom of Morgan Stanley or Goldman Sachs or Bank of America, you're thinking, how do I get engaged? I was looking before I came on at just stock prices, right? Ethereum, the platform that this new financial ecosystem is going to be built on is up 200% this year. Square app, 186%. PayPal, 99%. And then you go to Wells Fargo, down 60. Citibank, down 46. 
And so if you're a CEO of a big bank, you're saying, well, hold on, what's going on here? And so we are going to see over the next 10 years a rebuilding of the financial infrastructure of this country. Uh, it was interesting that PayPal hired uh, Paxos to do their integration with crypto because there's a domain expertise in this cryptocurrency space, in this blockchain space that's needed. Um, when I lived in Alabama, I was a helicopter pilot. There was a town called Enterprise, and they had a statue uh, that held up a bow weevil. And I was like, the craziest statue I've ever seen. Well, the bow weevil ate all the cotton, and then they planted peanuts, and that brought pus prosperity to the region. In some way, the cryptocurrency community is going to hold up a, a virus, the, 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 the COVID virus, because it was the COVID virus that really accelerated, as horrible as that to sound, accelerated adoption of crypto in two ways. The macro story with Bitcoin and the more maybe important story of digitalization of all cash, digitalization of the financial uh, services system uh, that's going to mostly be built on Ethereum. Bitcoin is the central bank of cyberspace. It's the central bank, except it's the fair central bank that respects the, the laws of thermodynamics and the conservation of energy, and it's never going to screw you. And there's no one that's ever going to change the rules on you. We are still in the review and consideration stage, but we've just launched a, a public consultation so that consumers and Europeans can actually express their preference and tell us whether they would be happy to use a, a digital euro just in the way they use a euro coin or a euro banknote, knowing that it is a central bank money that is uh, available and, and that they can rely upon. Bitcoin is the world's first cryptocurrency, and it works because of the world's first public blockchain network. What does Bitcoin do? It's simple. It lets you send and receive value to and from anyone in the world using nothing more than a computer and an internet connection. Now, why is it revolutionary? Because unlike every other tool for sending money over the internet, it works without the need to trust a middleman. The lack of any corporation in between means that Bitcoin is the world's first public digital payments infrastructure. And by public, I simply mean available to all and not owned by any single entity. Now, we have public infrastructure for information, for websites, for email. It's called the internet. 
But the only public payments infrastructure that we have is cash, as in paper money. And it only works in face-to-face -face transactions. Before Bitcoin, if you wanted to pay someone remotely, over the phone or the internet, then you could not use public infrastructure. You would rely on a private bank to open their books and add a ledger entry that debits you and credits the person you're paying. And if you both don't use the same bank, well, then there'll be multiple banks and multiple ledger entries in between. With Bitcoin, the ledger is the public blockchain, and anyone can add an entry to that ledger, transferring their Bitcoins to someone else. And anyone, regardless of their nationality, race, religion, gender, sex, or creditworthiness, can for absolutely no cost create a Bitcoin address in order to receive payments digitally. Bitcoin is the world's first globally accessible public money. Is it perfect? No. Neither was email when it was invented in 1972. Bitcoin's not the best money on every margin. Uh, it's not yet accepted everywhere. It's not used often to quote prices, and it's not always a stable store of value. But it is working, and the mere fact that it Bitcoin is the central bank of cyberspace. It's the central bank, except it's the fair central bank that respects the, the laws of thermodynamics and the conservation of energy, and it's never going to screw you. And there's no one that's ever going to change the rules on you. I'm a bit of a dinosaur, but I have warmed up to the fact that um, Bitcoin could be an asset class <clears throat> that has a lot of attraction to it as a store of value to both millennials and the new West Coast money. And as you know, they got a lot of it. It's been around for 13 years and with each passing day, it picks up more, more of its stabilization of the brand. So I own many, many more times gold than I own Bitcoin. But frankly, if the gold bet works, the Bitcoin bet will probably work better because it's thinner and more liquid and has a lot more beta to it institutional buy-in, at least intellectually, but do you still not have to ask the question, why? Uh, what, what problem is it solving that other assets or currencies uh, or commodities can't? Yeah, listen, it's, it's scarcity. It, it is as old as the first currencies, you know, well, how do I store my value? And people are worried that our governments, who have printed more and more and more fiat, uh, are less trustworthy, right? You see what happened in places like Zimbabwe or Weimar, Germany. There's a hundred examples of currencies debasing, uh, governments debasing their currency uh, to oblivion. Uh, but even, you know, something like, you know, the pound sterling, right? Like, if you think about it, the pound sterling used to buy you a pound of sterling. And now it buys you about this much sterling. And so there's been this long debasement even of, of, a, of a, a stable currency. And so people are going to Bitcoin because there are 21 million Bitcoins that'll ever be mined. There's a complete scarcity in it. People believe it's a store of value, right? It's a social construct. Yeah. And you can't change that. So let me ask you though about that correlation because it, because with risk on, people are taking uh, more, uh, more bets on things like Bitcoin. But how much of that is a bet on a bet on Bitcoin or, or the issues around just printing cash versus the, the operational potential as a transactional currency, given the news we just heard from PayPal, that PayPal is gonna allow cryptocurrencies as part of the wallet. How does that change yeah. this? I think that's, you know, the, in some ways, the shot heard around the world on Wall Street, right? PayPal has 346 million accounts, right? They're the 30th biggest bank in the US in deposits. And all of a sudden, every financial institution says, wait a minute, what do I'm doing? And so if you're at the boardroom of Morgan Stanley or Goldman Sachs or Bank of America, you're thinking, how do I get engaged? I was looking before I came on at just stock prices, right? Ethereum, the platform that this new financial ecosystem is gonna be built on is up 200% this year. Square app, 186%, PayPal, 99%. And then you go to Wells Fargo, down 60, Citibank, down 46. And so if you're a CEO of a big bank, you're saying, well, hold on, what's going on here? And so we are gonna see over the next 10 years, a rebuilding of the financial infrastructure of this country. Uh, it was interesting that PayPal hired uh, Paxos to do their integration with crypto because there's a domain expertise in this cryptocurrency space, in this blockchain space that's needed. Um, 
When I lived in Alabama, I was a helicopter pilot. There was a town called Enterprise, and they had a statue uh, that held up a bow weevil. And I was like, the craziest statue I've ever seen. Well, the bow weevil ate all the cotton, and then they planted peanuts, and that brought pos prosperity to the region. In some way, the cryptocurrency community is going to hold up a, a virus, the, 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 the COVID virus, because it was the COVID virus that really accelerated, as horrible as that to sound, accelerated adoption of crypto in two ways. The macro story with Bitcoin and the more maybe important story of right. digitalization of all cash, digitalization of the financial uh, services system uh, that's going to mostly be built on Ethereum. Senator-elect, uh, you got another first under your belt. This one, uh, very interesting. You're the first senator to own Bitcoin. I'm going to be fully transparent here and say I'm not well-versed in Bitcoin, but I know that there are a couple people who believe, yes, you should be an advocate for this type of currency, and then there are other people who are raising some concerns that this could be a, a front for money laundering or for some sort of tax evasion. Where do you stand? Where, how, do you hope to bring Bitcoin uh, into the national conversation? I do hope to bring Bitcoin into the national conversation. I'm a former state treasurer, and I invested our state's permanent funds. So I was always looking for a good store of value, and uh, Bitcoin uh, fits that bill. Uh, our own currency inflates. Uh, Bitcoin does not. It's uh, 21 million Bitcoin will be mined, and that's it. It is a finite supply. Uh, so I have confidence that this is going to be an important player in stores of value for a long time to come. Well, we are more well versed now after that answer, and uh, so Senator-elect, uh, you got another first under your belt. This one, uh, very interesting. You're the first senator to own Bitcoin. I'm going to be fully transparent here and say I'm not well-versed in Bitcoin, but I know that there are a couple people who believe, yes, you should be an advocate for this type of currency, and that there are other people who are raising some concerns that this could be a, a front for money laundering or for some sort of tax evasion. Where do you stand? Where how, Do you hope to bring Bitcoin uh, into the national conversation? I do hope to bring Bitcoin into the national conversation. I'm a former state treasurer, and I invested our state's permanent funds. So I was always looking for a good store of value, and uh, Bitcoin uh, fits that bill. Uh, our own currency inflates. Uh, Bitcoin does not. It's uh, 21 million Bitcoin will be mined, and that's it. It is a finite supply. Uh, so I have confidence that this is going to be an important player in stores of value for a long time to come. Well, we are more well versed now after that answer. And, uh, I'm a bit of a dinosaur, but I have warmed up to the fact that. Um, Bitcoin could be an asset class <clears throat> that has a lot of attraction to, as a store of value to both millennials and the new West Coast money. And as you know, they've got a lot of it. It's been around for 13 years and with each passing day, it picks up more, more of its stabilization of a brand. So I own many, many more times gold than I own Bitcoin. But frankly, if the gold bet works, the Bitcoin bet will probably work better because it's thinner and more liquid and has a lot more beta to it. And his newest book is just came out eight days ago called The Internet of Money, which is a masterpiece to read. Please help me welcome Andreas Antonopoulos. <laughs> Shopping, this is why Silicon. American this Express. is why Silicon Valley is competing with the U.S. with the Federal Reserve to be your bank. Yeah. Everybody wants to be your bank. Yeah. Baby. Everybody yeah. wants to because that's when they control you. Right. But that's also when you get loans at negative interest rate, so they actually pay you to take the loan, which you can pay off your student loan. This is going to be. A You're scaring the fuck out of no, me. No, no. This is what you wanted. You wanted universal basic income. Here it comes. This is going to. And by the way, it's going to work. This is the crazy thing. Now, the control will also work, but we will, the economy will be steerable. I mean, all the, I think that, will, that part will really work. But let me tell you, the apocalypse is coming, and you're going to need a Bitcoin. At least one. Are you have a Bitcoin one. salesman? No, Curry, no. Did I, get I was very anti-Bitcoin. Really? I was very anti-Bitcoin until I sold a shitload of them at like $900. And uh, I could have, you know, I could have really made a lot of money. Yeah, is, I got them for nothing. Is, I got them for 
people just gave them to me in the beginning. And I denied it. And then when you look at 10 years, I'm like, okay, I'm what I'm, what you call, I don't, fuck all the altcoins and all that stuff. I That's what I was going to say. Nah, I don't give a shit about but that. But the, is there a, a risk in, but here's the question about Bitcoin. Is there a risk in having that be the standard? Like, why can't there be competing cryptocurrencies? Like, why are we so, do we have to get committed to one? And if we do get committed to one, is there the possibility of some sort of manipulation, the same way we've seen with all the other currencies? Well, when ten, people get involved yeah, in money. Yeah, ten years of data have shown that Bitcoin really is the only one that you can trust. Right. Um, now it does. Really? Is that true? Yeah. I just said right for yeah. no reason. Yeah. The way <laughs> I, the way like I see cool it. Yeah, the say. way I see it. That's really the only one that you cannot manipulate, and all of the other coins are based off of it. Um, Do you know Andreas Antonopoulos? No, the name rings. Really brilliant, well. brilliant. I know guy. Max Kaiser. You know. Oh, okay. <laughs> sure, <laughs> that's, I've that's, seen his videos. I know, as well. Max. Max yeah. is. Uh, I've learned a lot, and I and I, you know, Max has been saying this from day one. Anyway, we have enough historical information to see that that's right. But that is increased in value no matter what you look at. Mm -hmm. the, the, the U.S. dollar back in my five thousand dollar truck in the seventies, fifty thousand dollars now. That value of that dollar has diminished by ten percent because they've just been printing more and more money. Let's start with a quick uh, poll here. How many of you have used? A digital currency like Bitcoin at least once. And how many of you own Bitcoin at this moment? Or any other digital currency? Okay. We can fix that. If you like, later on today, come find me. I would be delighted to demonstrate to you how to set up a Bitcoin wallet on your smartphone. And I will give you your first fraction of a Bitcoin, not a whole Bitcoin. And show you how a transaction works. Because Bitcoin and the digital currency revolution it has started is best demonstrated and experienced than explained. It's actually very difficult to explain Bitcoin. I've spent the last five years learning how to explain Bitcoin. That is my full-time job. Unfortunately, the developers keep making new stuff, which I then have to explain all over again. So, for a moment, forget everything you think you know about Bitcoin. Forget everything you've heard about blockchain. And let's start from basics. In 2011, I heard about Bitcoin for the first time. And my reaction was exactly the same as the reaction of everybody else who heard about Bitcoin the first time, including its founder. And that reaction was, ha! Nerd money. That's probably just for gambling. Six months later, I heard about Bitcoin again. And this time, I read the white paper that launched this system. And my background in computer science and distributed systems allowed me to see behind the illusion of what I thought Bitcoin was, and it blew my mind. In my life, I have now had six occasions in which I have become absolutely obsessed with a system of technology to the point of forgetting to eat, forgetting to sleep, and consuming as much knowledge as I possibly can. My first computer when I was 10 years old. My first programming language experience. My first modem. My first access to the web, the first time I used the web browser. The first time I downloaded and installed the Linux operating system. And then Bitcoin. When I discovered it, I spent four months consuming as much as I could, except food. I lost 26 pounds on the highly inadvisable diet of obsession. I have not emerged from that, because I keep finding new layers of depth to understand this. And the reason it's so fascinating is because it isn't what it appears to be at first glance.
Bitcoin isn't money. The blockchain isn't a system of currency. It is a platform of trust. It's not a company. It's not a product. It's not a service you sign up for. It's not a currency. Currency is just the first application. It is the concept of decentralization applied to the human communication of value. Because what is money? NQ told us it's an illusion. It's imaginary. And the reason we don't grasp that is because it's so deeply embedded in our civilization. Money is one of the oldest technologies that humanity has. It precedes writing. How do we know that? The very first samples of writing we have are spreadsheets. They are tallies and ledgers of debts owed. And money pre-existed that writing. You might even speculate that money had an oral tradition until it needed to invent a written tradition, so writing was created for it. In the history of money that now spans tens of thousands of years, there have been maybe five major changes. From pure barter exchange to the introduction of the first abstraction of value, shells, feathers, beads, nuts, stones, and then precious metals, and then paper money, and then plastic money, and now network money. Bitcoin introduces a platform on which you can run currency as an application on a network without any central points of control, a system completely decentralized like the internet itself. It is not money for the internet, but the internet of money. And what is money? Money is a language. Money is a linguistic abstraction. Money is a language that we use to communicate value to each other. Money simply allows us to express value, and that value may have economic consequences, but it also has other consequences. We use money to express and create social bonds and relationships and associations and to create organization. Bitcoin is the first system of money that is not controlled by any entity that is completely decentralized. And what that does is it introduces the very same things that the internet brought to communication. If money is speech, if money is a language, and you disconnect it from all other media, and you make it pure speech, pure content, an internet content type, a protocol designation, money over IP, it completely separates it from all of these previous notions of nations, sovereign issuers, institutions that control. And so we go from institution-based money to network-based money. And of course, everyone will welcome this with open arms. Not a chance. What do you think they said the first time someone was presented with a gold depository certificate instead of a gold coin? They said, that's not money. Go away. What do you think happened in 1950 the first time someone showed up 
at a motel and presented their diner's club membership card and said, I'll pay with this piece of paper. That's not money. Go away. And now we're on the verge of a new transformation of money. We're on the verge of creating the first completely global, completely borderless, completely decentralized, and completely open form of money. One where you can build applications because this money is programmable. And you don't need to ask anyone's permission to launch an application any more than you need to ask permission to launch an application on the internet. And the only requirement to have a successful application on the internet of money is two interested participants. That is your market segment, and you have an application. And a million applications will flourish. When you push innovation to the edges of the network, when you remove the requirement for permission, what happens? Exponential explosion in innovation. The applications that could not be built on the old systems of money because they required permission, because they required a significantly large market segment, because they required adoption by many in order to be available at all. Now, None of those requirements exist. Anyone in the world can download an application or use even a feature phone with text messaging and immediately acquire the same powers that institutions of banking have today. Do you have Don't Be Evil in the cash apps? <laughs> no, 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 no. Maybe should, no. Maybe we should take it. It's no. open. It's free no. now. One of, one of our, one of our like, equivalent operating principles within cash and square is like under like how do we understand someone's struggle like how do we understand like how do we have the empathy for like what they're struggling with and like when it comes to finance they're struggling with a lot yeah typically they're struggling with a ton what was the the <laughs> thought process with i mean one of the things that's kind of cool about the cash app is that you can buy and sell bitcoin yeah um are you going are you guys going to consider other forms of cryptocurrency as well not right now i so back to the internet i believe the internet will have a native currency Really? It'll have a native currency, and I don't know if it's Bitcoin. I, I think it will, because just given all the tests it's been through and the principles behind it, how it was created, and um, you know, it was, it was something that was born on the internet, that was developed on the internet, that was tested on the internet. It, it, it is of the internet, and mm. the reason we, um, you know, we enabled uh, the purchasing of Bitcoin within within the Cash App is. One, we want to learn about the technology and we want to put ourselves out there and take some risk. We're the first publicly traded company to actually offer it as a service. We're the first publicly traded company to talk to the SEC about Bitcoin and what that what that means. And it it made us uncomfortable. We had to we had to, you know, like really understand what was going on and and that was critical and important. And then the second thing is that we, you know, we would we would love to see something become a global currency it, it it enables more access it, it allows us to serve more people it allows us to move much faster around the world and um we uh we we thought we were going to start with how you can use it transactionally but we noticed that people were treating it more like an asset like a like a virtual gold and we wanted to um we wanted just to make that easy like um just the simplest way uh, to buy and sell Bitcoin, but we also knew that it had to come with a lot of education. It had to come with constraint because, you know, two years ago people did some really unhealthy things about you know purchasing Bitcoin. They maxed out their credit cards and um, put all their life savings into into Bitcoin. So we we developed some very simple uh, restrictions and constraints, like you can you can't buy Bitcoin on the Cash App with a credit card. You have to. It has to be the money you actually have in it. And we look for day trading, which we uh, we discourage and shut down. Like that, that's not what we were trying to build. That's not what we were trying to optimize for. We made a, a children's book explaining what Bitcoin is and where it came from and how people use it and where it might be going. So we we really tried to take on the role of education and 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 to have some like very simple 
healthy constraints that allow to be allowed people to consider what their actions are in, in the space. Now, when you have something like the Cash App, which is a, it's very much a disruptive technology in terms of like decentralization of of banks and and, and, and currency, and you know, to have it where everything is going right, at, you're direct depositing a paycheck right into app if you so choose. And then you could also buy Bitcoin, which is another disruptive technology. I mean, that, this is a, another step towards this sort of new way of doing things. Yeah. And is there pushback from, from any companies or is there? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, like you, you just look at like some of the major banks and their consideration around Bitcoin. They all love blockchain. Uh, because of the efficiencies it can create for their business and potentially new business lines. But, um, you know, I think there is a... Explain blockchain to people for people who don't know what we're talking Black about. Blockchain is a distributed ledger. And it, what that means is that um, it, it's basically a distributed database where, you know, the, the source of truth can be verified at any point around the network. And you can see, you know, um, this, this annotation around how content or how r around money like traveled. Um, so you don't have to go to an institution to so get the, the records. Yeah, there's no directly. centralized check. There's right. no centralized control over it. Um, and I think that is uh, threatening. It's, it's, it's certainly threatening um, to certain services behind banks and financial institutions. It's threatening to some governments as well. Um, so I, I just look at this and like, how do we embrace this technology? Not react to it in a in, you know more from a threat standpoint but like what does it enable us to do and where does our value shift and that's what we should be talking about right now is like how our value shifts and there's always really strong answers to that question but if you're not willing to ask the question in the first place you will become irrelevant because technology will just continue to march on and make you irrelevant mm -hmm. and it's the people that like are, are you know growing up with this technology or born with the technology only knowing that technology or are asking the tough questions of themselves that are they're going to be super disruptive to their business and they're they're thinking about it right now and they're and they're taking actions and you know we're doing we're doing that at square and we're doing that at twitter and like that to me represents longevity that represents uh, our ability to to thrive and we we got to push ourselves we got to make ourselves uncomfortable and we got to disrupt what we held sacred and and what you know we think is success today because uh, otherwise it's not going to be bigger than what we have today somebody saying hey all of you guys let, let all these guys go at it let them just figure it out let them put it all together let them figure out all the mistakes let guys screw the whole thing up and then five years ten years later you know, the world government, the governments come over and take over and they centralize and they say, listen guys, thank you so much for all your help, but now we're gonna take it over. So who, who is the, who is, is it really the people doing it or are there some people more powerful than you and I that are behind this? Right, so a couple of things there. First of all, the idea of taking over Bitcoin is you have to kind of dig into that and understand what, what, what those words are implying. So to take over, uh, we'll get to that in a second, but let's, let's go back to kind of in a broader context here. So the, who, who created it, you know, and why did they create it? The history of Bitcoin before the 2009 uh, beginning of it, January 3rd of 2009, there's a 20 year history behind it of the, what are called the cypher punks. And these are, uh, developers, programmers, hackers, who were always trying to figure out what we call digital scarcity. And I myself have a patent uh, on digital scarcity, U.S. patent 5950176. It's the a virtual specialist technology uh, that is a patent that covers uh, digital scarcity as well as it's the first commercial prediction market. So the prediction market industry was pretty much, I invented that in 1996 and um, digital scarcity is this idea that can you create um, assets digitally that are scarce uh, in a world of the internet where everything is basically easily to replicate you know what we know about the internet is that every, it's very easy to copy things that's what makes the internet the internet you can send emails to 10,000 people at a click of a mouse because it's easy to copy everything yeah. and you create um, scarcity digital scarcity and um, so I know from experience, from my patent and my work at the Hollywood Stock Exchange, which I created in 1996, we eventually sold that to Cantor Fitzgerald in 2001. 
But um, I know from my work in this in this space, um, the limit, the difficulty it was to come up with a decentralized digital scarcity, which is what Bitcoin accomplishes. Uh, unlike every other attempt, is a centralized uh, digital scarcity, and that's not the same thing. Um, so that's that's the first point. The second point, uh, in terms of uh, can it be taken over, the the fact is that the Bitcoin network runs at 120 quintillion calculations per second right now. Uh, to give you an idea of how big a number that is, if you were to add up every grain of sand on every beach in the world, it's about seven quintillion. So Bitcoin's running at 120 quintillion calculations per second. It's the biggest distributed computer network ever in history. And the cost of taking it over is beyond the reach of any government. Um, and it's beyond the reach of any group of governments. There is no entity or group of entities that have the computer power or the money to attack Bitcoin in any meaningful way, uh, which makes it uh, indestructible, immutable, uncensorable, and unconfiscatable as well, which is an attribute that a lot of people are waking up to because it's not the same with gold. Gold is not unconfiscatable, and certainly fiat money is not unconfiscatable either. All right, and then you said money. How, how is money going to change? How is money? Or well, poor people don't have bank accounts, and so when they have an emergency, they want to borrow, save, it's very tough. Uh, small transactions, the fees are just too high when you have banks and ATMs and all that. If we take the cell phone and just use digital currency, then you can have all those financial services. So two billion people who don't have any kind of bank account will have all sorts of innovative services, help them save, pay for education. Uh, and it requires a little bit of work getting the regulation right, getting it to critical mass, getting people to trust it. But the magic of that cell phone with the right software means that people have banking and that's really big for their lives. So they can borrow when they need to. And, that's interesting because uh, everyone has a, a, a cell phone and a smartphone. Bitcoin is something that you've uh, been interested in and supportive of. In fact, uh, one can pay for a tour on Virgin Galactic up to the moon with Bitcoin. I think the, the Winklevoss twins have said that they would do exactly that. Do you think this is a currency, a currency that's really going to work eventually? Well, I think it is working. Um, and uh, there will be other currencies like it that may, may be even better. Um, but in the meantime, um, there's a big industry around Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, people have made fortunes out of Bitcoin. Some people have lost money out of Bitcoin. And so that's another reallocation of trillions of dollars. And then in financial services, you know, Chris talked about it earlier, but Bitcoin and things like it is the equivalent of the red pill. Okay, we are entering a completely world of uncharted water. Have right you now. made any investments in Bitcoin? So, I mean, I personally, I own Bitcoin in my hedge fund. I own Bitcoin in my fund. I own Bitcoin in my private account. Uh, it is a huge deal. It's a huge, huge, huge deal. Because what you're talking about right now is for the next three to five years, an unbelievably better store value. It is gold 2.0. Right? The value of gold that hedges the world economy about $9 trillion, right? 1,300 an ounce, of which only $100 to $150 is the actual production value. So all the rest of it is imputed. Where, Lena, you and I have decided that it's worth 1,300 an ounce. Well, guess what? I can do the same thing with Bitcoin, except now it's, I can do it outside the purview of every single government. It's being used everywhere where you would think it would be used. Russia, Iran, Iraq, Egypt, Venezuela, Argentina, everywhere where you have currency pressure, everywhere where you want to basically shield your assets. And then after that, it'll probably become a payment mechanism. So in all of these three industries, you're talking about trillions of dollars up for grabs. Up for grabs, right? And it's just about trying something right. and taking a few months to understand what the opportunity is and then hit the scene. And I think that the cool thing is it's easier to know how to code. It's actually useful in a way where, you know, you can probably hack something together yourself. You can find folks. And so this is the time where people should be trying really big, crazy things. That's a great way to end. Thank you so much, Mark. Need to move money from place to place. The cost of doing so, the overhead, as you put it, makes me think, believe it or not, of Bitcoin, because some people have said, hey, Bitcoin is the answer to those problems. Are you a believer? Well, Bitcoin is exciting because it shows how cheap it can be. Uh, Bitcoin is, is better than currency in that uh, you don't have to 
me physically in the same place. And of course, for large transactions, currency can, can get pretty inconvenient. The customers we're talking about aren't trying to be anonymous. You know, they're willing to be uh, known. So it, 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 the Bitcoin technology is key, and you could add to it or you could build a similar technology uh, where there's enough attribution that people feel comfortable. This has nothing to do with uh, terrorism or uh, any type of, of money laundering. If you ask what are the things where there's, you know, what, what's very charismatic uh, and that people are not paying enough attention to, I think there are these pockets in biotech that I, I find like that. You know, the one other one that I've, I've, I've been looking at a lot more have been the uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, and, uh, and while I'm skeptical of, of most of them, uh, I, I do think people are, are, um, are a little bit, uh, are maybe, maybe underestimating Bitcoin uh, specifically, because it is like, it's like a reserve form of money. It's like gold. Um, and, um, and it's just a store of value. You don't actually need to use it to make payments. And it's been, you know, it's, there's about $70 billion worth of Bitcoin in the world. There's $9 trillion worth of gold. And, um, and if Bitcoin ends up being the cyber equivalent of gold, you know, it has a, it has a, it has a great potential left. So that's, and it's a, it's a very different kind of thing from what people in, Sil people in Silicon Valley normally focus on companies, not, you know, algorithms or protocols. But uh, this may be, this may be uh, one exception that's, uh, that's very underestimated. Well, people question it, and I know there's been so much debate about Bitcoin, but they question it because what is it based on? I mean, you see that the dollar is based on, you know, the, the trust of the Treasury, the trust of the U.S. government. What is Bitcoin based on? Well, the, the argument, it's, it's based on the, um, on the security of the map, which tells you that it can never be, um, it can never be diluted by a government. It can never, um, it can never be, it can't be hacked. Um, and it's a form of money that's absolutely, uh, that's secure in an absolute way. Um, and uh, of course you could ask the same question about gold. That's why I use the gold analogy. You could say, what, what is gold based that's on? True. Why is gold yeah. valuable? Well, it's a, it's a tangible asset though, gold. It's a tangible asset, but it's also hard to mine. So if it was easy to mine gold, then it wouldn't be that valuable because we would just have way more gold. So Bitcoin is also, um, it's, it's, it's mineable like gold. It's hard to mine. It's, it's actually harder to mine than gold. And so in that sense, um, it's, it's more constrained. And so, yeah, there, there are a number of things that, uh, that, uh, that I think make it somewhat similar to gold. And then the question is just, does this become, does this become um, more widely and it's More anonymous, likely. right? I mean, that's one of the, the beauties of it. You can be anonymous using Bitcoin. Yeah, it's, it's half anonymous, half not. So it's, it's, again, this intermediate thing. There's a question whether that's right or not. But it's, it's a bearer instrument. So if you, if you have the Bitcoin, if you know the key, you can, you can go anywhere. Most of the time, um, most securities are registered, not bearer securities. So it's a very unusual kind of a security. All right, let's talk about Bitcoin. I do own a small amount of Bitcoin. There's simply nothing like Bitcoin. It's the only one. Take 1%, put it in Bitcoin. You'll be very happy, my friend. You can't deny the success of Bitcoin this year. Maybe I should put some to work. Maybe you've convinced me. It's a major benefit of our, of our time together today. I'm ready to invest. Former boss at Coinbase's CEO, Brian Armstrong, um, sent out last week, and he said that the Treasury could be, quote, planning to rush out some new regulation regarding self-hosted crypto wallets before the end of the term. Is that true? Yeah, look, um, and Melissa, you know, rumors abound in Bitcoin more than almost any other place. What I would tell you is we're very focused on getting this right. We're very focused on not killing this. And it's equally important that we develop the networks behind Bitcoin and other cryptos as it is that we prevent money laundering and terrorism financing. So believe me, there's a balance here and it's going to work for everybody. So that's a neither a yes or no answer to that. Should we be expecting some new regulations by, by the end of the Trump term? I think you're going to see a lot of good news for crypto by the end of the Trump term. Some of it's going to have to do with the banks connecting the blockchain. Some of it's going to be more clarity around the nature of these assets. So believe me, there's going to be very positive messages coming out. At the same time, it's a dangerous world out there. We have to be honest about that, that nobody's going to ban Bitcoin. Nobody's going to ban some of these transmission technologies. I think it's going to be a lot less bad than people are worried about. Tyler, I'll, I'll start with you. What have you been doing over the last eight months to accommodate this meteoric rise we've seen in Bitcoin and have you been personally doubling down on your investment in Bitcoin? So we've just been hodling. Um, our thesis is that Bitcoin is gold 2.0, that it will disrupt gold. 
And if it does that, it has to have a market cap of $9 trillion. Um, so we think that price is Bitcoin. At, it could price one day at $500,000 of Bitcoin. So at $18,000 Bitcoin, it's, it's a hold, or at least if you don't have any, it's, it's a buy opportunity because we think there's a 25X from here. But very importantly, early next year, we're going to allow cryptocurrencies to be a funding source for any transaction happening on all 28 million of our merchants. And that will significantly bolster the utility of cryptocurrencies. If you bought a basket of cryptocurrencies two years ago, and there's many, many, many of them, you haven't made a lot of money. There's simply nothing like Bitcoin. And so it's the only one. And that's a little perverse in the sense, if you look at the stock market, it's not the stock market, it's a market of stocks. There's many different ones you can buy, but you can't seem to play that game in the crypto space. You have to be very concentrated to get these returns in one cryptocurrency, Bitcoin. The Federal Reserve is a private entity, and the Federal Reserve Bank's 2015 estimated net income was $100.2 billion. They then transferred approximately $97.7 billion of that to the U.S. Treasury. So that means they profit about $2.5 billion simply for going, poof, there's your money. Ta-da! And then keep in mind, keep in mind, it's not printed, all right? Most of it's not printed. So really, they get $2.5 billion for just going, Money. There it is. There it is. I just did it. It makes it makes as much sense as paying someone a billion dollars for like picturing the color blue in their mind. What effort did that take? On top of that, there's no maximum amount of dollars that we can print. You know, we we can just keep pumping them out like a mullet-headed couple firing new kids out onto the lawn all summer long. The national debt, the national debt doesn't even matter because we can print as much money as we want. Bitcoin, on the other hand, has a maximum amount of 21 million Bitcoin. That is all there will ever be. Uh, for a long time, you were a skeptic of Bitcoin and some cryptocurrencies, but you recently appear to have changed your mind about that. What happened? Well, COVID happened, and the great monetary inflation happened, and that made me begin to think about how do you want to be positioned in your portfolio going forward? So that's really what tripped my interest in, in Bitcoin. Um, and you have to realize, if you just think about, say, Bitcoin versus cash, right? Bitcoin. When I think of stores of value, I think of it four ways. Purchasing power, trustworthiness, liquidity, and portability. That, that's kind of the, the categories I put it in. So when it comes to when it comes to trustworthiness, Bitcoin's 11 years old. There's very little trust in it. We're watching the birthing of a store of value. And whether that succeeds or not, only time will tell. Uh, what I do know is that every day that goes by and Bitcoin survives, the trust in it will go up. Uh, if you take cash, on the other hand, and you think about it from a purchasing power standpoint, if you own cash in the world today, you know your central bank has an avowed goal of depreciating its value 2% per year. So you have, in essence, a wasting asset in your hand. So uh, Bitcoin, I think it's a, a great speculation. Uh, I've got uh, something between one and I think just over just over one percent of my assets in Bitcoin. Uh, maybe it's almost two. Uh, that seems like the right number right now. Uh, it's not for me. It's not the greatest. It's not the you know the great cure for the for all the monetary ills, etc. It's a great speculation. That's what I would say Bitcoin is. Bitcoin may well be a substitute for gold. We don't know that yet, but it's starting to behave that way. But is Bitcoin a substitute for the dollar? So uh, I think really what we are seeing and the, the discussions we are having with the clients is that people are looking for portfolios that have a reasonable balance between risky assets and safe assets. And what is uh, happening is that the bucket 
that used to be a lot of U.S. fixed income is getting put into all kinds of other buckets, being gold, being Bitcoin, or Chinese bonds to some degree, right? So there's sort of a shift out of that safe U.S. dollar assets that was the U.S. Treasury into a spectrum of other alternative safe assets, and Bitcoin is a part of that now. That's the really what's new about this year is that institutional investors are getting engaged in Bitcoin. So it's very different from the initial sort of very speculative retail move you had in, in cryptocurrencies. There are a lot of institutional money that is involved in Bitcoin this year. Bitcoin rising above $19,000 as it closes in on its record high price. Joining us to discuss this and where cryptocurrency goes from here is Anthony Pompliano. He is the co-founder and partner of Morgan Creek Digital Assets. Uh, good morning to you. We haven't seen you in, in, a, in a bit now, and a lot has happened uh, since we've seen you in terms of where this has gone. Uh, where do you think it's headed? Um, has it moved too fast? That is the question of the morning. Absolutely. Well, good morning to everyone. Thanks for, uh, for having me. I, I think the key piece here, and we've, we've been talking about this now for almost two years, is just, you know, Bitcoin is the um, uh, kind of winner of a supply and demand uh, exercise. And if you look at uh, what happened in May, we had the uh, Bitcoin halving. Obviously, the 1,800 Bitcoin a day went down to 900 coming into the uh, circulating supply. And at the same time, we've had this macro environment that has forced people to look for inflation hedge assets. So you had capital flows uh, due to the fear of inflation. Uh, and then also you've had many big buyers come into the market. So whether it's Square, PayPal, GBTC, uh, et cetera, uh, there's a new study that came out, uh, I think from Pantera Capital that said Square's buying up about 40% of the daily new incoming supply. Uh, PayPal already, even though they just launched buying up about 70% of that supply. And I think the key piece is uh, people coming from the Wall Street uh, kind of investing world have to understand is that most Bitcoiners are not going to sell their Bitcoin. Right, 63% or more of the Bitcoin hasn't moved in the last 12 months. And so what you're really seeing is just increase in demand. There's a, a lack of supply or low supply, uh, and that's driving the price higher. Um, and, and you know, I think that'll kind of continue going into 2021, um, and, uh, and the price will appreciate pretty aggressively from here. When you say aggressively, what do you think is fair value for Bitcoin and how would you get there? Yeah, fair value is always a hard one because everyone uses different kind of metrics. Um, you know, earlier this year, uh, I started talking about uh, once we kind of saw what the macro environment was going to do, uh, I really talked about it as kind of rocket fuel for Bitcoin's price. You, you basically dropped interest rates to zero. You printed a bunch of money. Um, if you even look at things like, you know, Janet Yellen becoming the Treasury Secretary, uh, she's notorious for kind of being OK with higher levels of inflation. The Federal Reserve targeting over 2 percent inflation uh, for a sustained period of time. And so I don't think it's you know that crazy to see a hundred thousand dollar Bitcoin price by the end of 2021. Um, and if we continue to get bigger and bigger buyers, right? Many of the largest hedge funds in the world are now starting to get exposure to the asset. You see people like the Stanley Druckenmillers, Millers, uh, the Bill Millers, uh, Paul Tudor Joneses coming in. Uh, if this kind of tips over and all of a sudden it becomes uh, kind of a consensus trade, uh, it wouldn't surprise me to see something even higher than a hundred thousand um, dollars. And you know, it's kind of okay, give me, give me your I know you're very bullish, but give me the thing that would keep you up at night. What would turn it the other way? Yeah, I, I always talk about the first thing is a self-inflicted wound, right? If there was a bug introduced into the code or something like that. Uh, the second thing would be uh, some sort of geopolitical risk um, where we saw really, really aggressive, coordinated um, uh, kind of action by multiple nation states. Uh, but again, I think that those things are very low probability of occurring. Uh, so it doesn't really kind of um, seem like that's going to happen in the short term. Shepard Smith here. Thanks for watching CNBC on YouTube. So, um, what is Bitcoin? What are cryptocurrencies? Um, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are a form of money uh, invented recently and introduced on the internet. This is a form of money that only exists in a digital form, and it can be sent and received just like an email. Now, the advantage of that is that in many countries, people have very limited access to traditional financial institutions. But even in developed countries, um, traditional financial instruments like credit cards and checks and paper money are not suitable for our digital lifestyle. And so it's actually very difficult to use 
uh, financial systems that were designed in the 1950s, like credit cards, online to do e-commerce. A lot of people suffer from identity theft, um, charged back transactions, stolen credit cards, being overcharged by uh, vendors once they've given the credit card, and all of these problems uh, and bureaucratic problems with traditional financial payments. One of the advantages of having a new digital currency that lives on the internet and operates entirely in digital form is that it is much more suited to our modern digital lifestyle. So doing things like uh, making payments online is a lot safer, uh, it's faster, uh, and in many cases it's cheaper. Uh, when you make a payment with a credit card, you may not see the level of fees that is being charged because that gets charged to the merchant and not you. But inevitably, because of market economics, someone's going to pay for that fee and what the merchants are going to do is pass that on to you in higher prices. So another advantage of using this new digital form of money is um, that you can save because the fees are lower uh, for you and lower for the merchant. Uh, it's more secure, there's less opportunity for chargebacks and fraud, you risk your identity less, and all of these things reduce the cost of doing commerce and engaging in commerce online. Now, your first experience with these digital currencies is not going to be as simple as you imagine. Remember back in the days when the first time you tried to do some online shopping or maybe the first time you tried to connect to the internet and send an email? Um, perhaps you struggled with modems and setting up a connection with an ISP. Um, maybe you had a clunky desktop, uh, a Windows machine, trying to install a browser uh, that was confusing and weird. Um, and gradually over time, a lot of these rough edges got smoothed out. Nowadays, you can take a, a device that's very easy to interact with, such as a tablet. Um, it already comes pre-installed with everything you need to use the internet. You can easily connect to a Wi-Fi hotspot. Um, you don't need to sign up with an account with almost anyone. Sending email and doing online shopping is easy. Well, digital currencies are still in the earlier stage, and as a result, the software is pretty clunky, the services are still in their very first iteration. The companies haven't yet developed easy ways to use them. So maybe digital currencies like Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies are not quite right for you yet. In places where people are desperate for financial services, where they have access to nothing other than cash, and they're surrounded by corrupt governments, corrupt officials, corrupt cops, and corrupt banks, um, the effort to learn and use this technology is well worth it because it can be a really meaningful change in their life circumstances. But for most Westerners, still, this is more of a curiosity. It's more of uh, an interesting technology. If you're a geek or fascinated by new technology, maybe you'll put in the effort to learn about it. Uh, in any case, it might be interesting to experience one of these transactions. But uh, don't let this early stage technology fool you. Just because it's clunky now doesn't mean it's going to be clunky forever. The fundamental principles and structure of these new digital currencies and the open world they create, where money can be transmitted, where commerce can be engaged, where people can hold on to their assets securely anywhere in the world and transact with anyone else near instantaneously, securely, and with very low or no fees. That is really going to change the world. You can either jump on that bandwagon now, maybe go through some of the early pain of trying out a new technology, or just be aware that this thing is happening. Wait a few years, and eventually it's going to be easy to use for everyone. And then we'll have to try to explain to our children and our descendants what the hell we were thinking with these plastic cards and this linseed and cotton money that was covered in germs. And they will not understand what we're talking about. Uh, Bitcoin has a lot of the characteristics of being an early investor in a tech company. And I didn't realize it until uh, after, uh, unfortunately, I came on your show and got besieged by God knows how many different people on Bitcoin. Uh, and again, I've, I've got 
small single digit investment in Bitcoin. That's it. I'm not a Bitcoin flag bearer. But what I learned was, and what I was so surprised by, is that Bitcoin has this enormous contingent of really, really smart and sophisticated people who believe in it. Uh, and, it's, and, and now when I think of the menu of, of the inflation hedges, uh, the, the thing that Bitcoin has, again, it's like investing with Steve Jobs and Apple or investing with Google early. You've got this group of, that's by the way, crowdsourced all over the world that are dedicated to seeing Bitcoin succeed in it becoming a commonplace store of value and transactional to boot uh, at, at, a, at a very basic level. And so I've never had an inflation hedge where you have a kicker, but you also have great intellectual capital behind it. So that makes me uh, even more constructive on it. If you think about it, if you're long twos, thirties, right, you're effectively short the bond market. That's your inflation hedge. You're really betting on the fallacy of mankind rather than uh, its ingenuity and entrepreneurialism. So, so I, I like Bitcoin even more now than I did then. I think we're in the first inning of Bitcoin. Uh, Shepard Smith here. Thanks for watching CNBC on YouTube. Hi, Julia. This year's Bitcoin rally is being driven by wealthy North Americans and long-term investors versus more active traders three years ago. Data firm Chainalysis analyzes public blockchain data to see where and how much people are buying. In 2017, the bulk of activity was coming from Asia. This year, though, there are more net inflows from Asia to U.S. exchanges. There are also some signs that more high net worth individuals and institutional investors are getting in. We've heard from big names like Paul Tudor Jones, Bill Miller, and Stan Druckenmiller backing Bitcoin recently, but it's also showing up in the numbers. Total accounts buying more than a million dollars worth of Bitcoin and then moving it off of exchanges has skyrocketed. That's up 180% from 2017 to this year. Analysts say that signals wealthy investors are loading up on Bitcoin and then moving it offline to stores somewhere a little more secure. Remember, 2017 was also the year of the initial coin offering and some frenzied trading activity. Not the case, though, this year. Chainalysis looked at Bitcoin moving in and out of individual accounts. They found more people are holding it versus trading it. Analysts at the data firm also say they're seeing investors now buying through some more mainstream venues like Square and PayPal, as well as Grayscale's publicly traded Bitcoin Trust. The new demand has also affected supply of Bitcoin. Investors have bought an additional 2.9 million Bitcoin over the past three years, which may be one factor boosting prices to an all-time high this week. John, back to you. Let's bring in Michael Saylor, CEO of MicroStrategy. Michael, great to have you with us. Um, we, we had you on because you're the CEO of a software company who decided to invest your cash into Bitcoin. Uh, and I'm wondering how, how you came about with that decision. Were you, were you thinking we've got a lot of cash because our business generates a lot of cash. So, you know, could it be treasuries or money market, straight up cash or Bitcoin? I mean, what was your thought process? Well, the story here is Due to the rapid expansion of the monetary supply by the central banks, the cost of capital has tripled from 5% to 15% over the past year. And if we look out over the next four years, bond coupons and EPS growth rates are going to need to exceed that hurdle in order to preserve wealth. We had 100, 500 million worth of cash, but we knew we were going to generate another 500 million worth of cash. And we realized that if we held it in cash, it was going to debase by 10, 15% a year, and I didn't want to lose half of it. So what isn't so well understood is the BTC, Bitcoin is the best safe haven treasury reserve asset in the world right now. And it's engineered to be superior to gold in all aspects. So that, that being the case, a lot of people understand the asset story of Bitcoin. It's up 100% annually each year for the past decade, more or less. What they don't understand is that Bitcoin's a, it's a monetary network. And as a monetary network, it's capable of storing and channeling energy over time without power loss. So we got really excited about this idea 
And we saw it as a solution for the store of value problem, not just for the $300 trillion of capital in the world, but for the 7.5 billion people right. on the planet. And so that that's pretty compelling. Mm -hmm. Um, you know the uh, sorry, ahead. sorry to interrupt, Michael, but you know, cash on a balance sheet and, and wanting to preserve the power of that cash is one thing. Investing it in something that's speculative is another. I mean, are you are you a software company or are you a Bitcoin hedge fund at this point? I mean, why bother with the software part of the business if your belief truly is is that Bitcoin is going to go up 100% every year, uh, you know, going forward? Well, first of all, we do have a software company generating cash, but if we simply swept the cash into fiat currency and allowed it to base at 15% a year, we'd be losing as much on the balance sheet as we generated from the P&L. So that didn't make sense. Um, on the other hand, the traditional concerns about Bitcoin have been that it might be hacked, it might be copied, it might be banned, and after a decade, it hasn't been hacked. No one's managed to copy it. It's not going to be banned. So although people look at it as being volatile, it's volatile maybe in the first decade. The next decade going forward, it doesn't look like it's going to be that volatile. It actually looks like it's emerging as the primary Treasury Reserve asset for people that are looking for some way to avoid the great monetary inflation. How do you, view, think though, how do you view, though, the size of, of your Bitcoin position relative to the size of your business, and is there a point at which, even just for portfolio management purposes, you trim your Bitcoin position in order to be conservative? I mean, your, your enterprise value is, what, $2.4 billion or so? I'm not sure what your Bitcoin position is. You had initially invested $400 million or so back in August, and that position's got, got to be enormous by now. Well, look, we, we love the enterprise business intelligence business, and we want to be in it. But we don't want to decapitalize the company by drawing our treasury to zero, and we don't want to allow our treasury to be debased by 10 or 20 percent a year either. So we have to do something. I think that as investors start to understand the Bitcoin story, they're going to migrate their capital on the Bitcoin network, and that's going to create a virtuous cycle of adoption followed by price appreciation, followed by value accretion, followed by technology integration from companies like you see Square and PayPal. It'll be Apple and Google shortly. That's going to drive more adoption. And, and that means that you really want to plug your company into the Bitcoin monetary network, right? It's, it's probably the biggest thing that's happened over the past decade. It's, it's going to be bigger than the FANG stocks. It's going to be bigger than Apple, Amazon, Facebook, the social networks. And it's the ideal time to plug into it because 99% of the investors don't understand what I just said. And with $350 billion of monetary energy in the Bitcoin network, it's all but unstoppable at this point. Last quick question, Michael, and this is a simple straightforward. Are you a software company or are you a Bitcoin fund? Our P&L is a software company, and we sell the world's best enterprise business intelligence software. Okay. Our balance sheet is no longer invested in dollars. Our balance sheet is invested in BTC because we believe that's the best treasury reserve asset we could choose in the world. One company making a bold move on the cryptocurrency, MicroStrategy, scooping up nearly 30,000 bitcoins for 650 million bringing that company's total Bitcoin holding to more to more than $1 billion today. Joining me now, MicroStrategy Chairman and CEO, Michael Saylor. Michael, I got to tell you, you've become something of a superstar evangelist for Bitcoin, and you put your money where your mouth is. Tell us why. Why are you such a believer, and where is Bitcoin going? Look, there's two things that I want to say to the world. First of all, Bitcoin itself is an institutional grade safe haven asset and it's engineered to be superior to gold in all respects. That makes it the ideal store of value solution to every individual institution corporation on earth. The second thing is Bitcoin is the world's first digital monetary network. It's like Facebook or Google for money. It's, uh, it's the first network in the history of the world where you can collect and channel and store all the money in the world for 100 years and not lose any of it. That makes it 100 times bigger than big tech. Um, everybody needs to plug into it. Every individual, every corporation, every government's got a problem, which is how, how do they deal with a collapsing currency and what's their store of value? Bitcoin's the solution. Michael, uh, from 2011 to 2020, 
Bitcoin rallied 6,271,233% or annualized 203% uh, annualized to 2.2% for gold. Unders underscoring your point, but also making people wonder just how much more room is there to the upside? I mean, I've heard targets of a million. Look, first of all, it's not a rally, it's not a bubble. It's a chain reaction spreading like a fire in cyberspace. And it's being driven, it's driving the flow of conventional assets because of escalating risk of global currency devaluation, tech disruption, social dislocation, political uncertainty. So if you're a corporation and you're sitting with US dollars on your balance sheet, they're liabilities. You're gonna lose 15% of your purchasing power against scarce assets every year for the next five years. It's like a melting ice cube. Bitcoin, as you pointed out, is going up more than 100% a year. So the logical thing for every corporation to do is convert their balance sheet from USD to BTC. And the answer to your question is, Bitcoin's gonna demonetize gold, negative yielding sovereign debt, low yielding sovereign debt, and all of the index funds that are being used as a store of value. There's 100 to $200 trillion worth of stuff there. Like, this thing can go on for quite a while. It seems like Elon Musk, someone who's well known for being ahead of the curve, is now intrigued by it. You, you've actually gone on Twitter and social media uh, encouraging them to make a move, you know, uh, and, and follow up on what he's saying. Uh, you think he will soon? You think he'll make, take the dive into Bitcoin? I can't speak for Elon, but what I can say is that if you've got $20 billion on your balance sheet and you know that you're going to lose 20% of the purchasing power a year and it's going to be cut in half in the next three to four years, the simple move is convert the $20 billion into Bitcoin, let it double, double, and double again. As soon as the market figures out what's going on, there's going to be a stampede to follow you. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy it's, and a positive feedback loop, and it's, it's a screaming good idea to build shareholder value. Well, uh, next time you come on, I want to talk about the company, too, because you, you've done some revolutionary things uh, in the whole cloud space as well. Uh, we really appreciate it. Love the way you laid it out. I want to open my Coinbase account right after the, right after the show. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you. Dan, thank you very much uh, for joining us here. I mean, uh, what are the distinctions between the way Bitcoin is being traded, used, thought about, uh, that, that you think is uh, distinct from what happened three years ago? Well, we have a Bitcoin shortage right now. Every four years, the number of Bitcoins cut in half, and that happened this summer. And we have buyers now, like PayPal, who just themselves are consuming more than 100% of all the Bitcoins that are issued. So when you have big institutional buyers, big uh, investors purchasing more than 100% of the Bitcoins that are issued is going to cause the price to squeeze up. When you say a shortage, you mean a shortage of newly created Bitcoin relative to the demand. They're not shrinking the absolute amount, right? So, um, but, but, but I mean, the, the demand is not some, you know, naturally occurring organic thing. It seems as if there's a lot of trend following going on. It seems as if a lot of people are facilitating the popularity of it. Uh, and and w why does the price action have any connection to something beyond people seem to really like it? Well, that's really it. Like if, if 100 million people think it's useful, that, that's why it has value. And there's different uses. Some people use it to store wealth. Some people in emerging market countries that have banks that might be failing or have other issues with their currency use it to store money. People use it to send money across borders if you're a, a migrant. So there's lots of different use cases. And uh, six years ago, there were only a million people on earth that used it. And it was worth $200 a Bitcoin. And now there's 100 million people that use it. It's worth $20,000 a Bitcoin. Um. We did see that little pullback yesterday in, in the price of Bitcoin, uh, perhaps uh, connected to some of these reports of, you know, noise that the Treasury Department might be looking at some restrictions or uh, or not. But these, these things pop up from time to time. Also, a reported hack of one of the, the bigger wallet uh, providers. We do hear this and, you know, SEC making a move against uh, Ripple, I guess. So a lot of things uh, are undetermined in terms of the regulatory treatment ultimately of this asset class. Is that not a risk? 
It is. This is obviously very, very early days for a brand new asset class, and so there's going to be volatility on both sides. Um, but you know, those create the news items that you know the migrant using money, uh, using Bitcoin to send money back home to their mom in the Philippines. That doesn't make the news, but that's really what's driving the price. Well, I mean, but what's the ratio of people who are trading it to using it for something besides, you know, a, an asset class, a speculative asset class? I mean, uh, you know, $100 bills are used to, to move money, and a Western Union used to move cash all over the world. That stuff doesn't trade at a premium. It doesn't go up three times in a year in value. Sure, but it took Western Union 140 years to get where they're at today, and Bitcoin's only 11 years old, and already 7% of all remittance to Mexico is going over cryptocurrency. So it, it's progressing at a much faster rate than a legacy system. And, you know, the, one of the storylines, as you've mentioned, is it, it, bigger institutions are certainly allocating more in this area. Uh, they've decided that it's something worth owning, perhaps, uh, instead of something like gold. Uh, but are they any more reliable? Are, there, are they stronger hands than the, uh, the, than the individuals that seem to be driving things a few years ago? I think so. In, in 2017, there was obviously a, a media frenzy around it. There were all kinds of newly issued tokens that really didn't have any basis to exist that were coming out. And it really was a speculative frenzy. This is being driven by the most famous global macro investors. This is being driven by public companies like Square and PayPal and MicroStrategy, uh, big endowments are buying. So, you know, these are the types of people buying for, you know, the 5, 10, 20 year horizon rather than just a quick flip. For more, let's bring in Rashir Sharma, the chief global strategist of Morgan Stanley Investment Management. Uh, he's also the author of the 10 Rules of Successful Nations. Uh, Rashir, you write that uh, on average, nations that have enjoyed the term reserve currency have done so for about 94 years. The dollar is going on 100 years as of 2020. But why do you think that Bitcoin could pose a challenge to the dollar where the euro or the yuan could not? Exactly, because all these central banks are following essentially the same policies that they're printing a lot. Um, and so therefore, for the last few years, I've been relatively optimistic on the US dollar as people have tried to pump up the euro or the Chinese currency, knowing that those currencies don't really pose a threat to the US dollar's reserve currency status. But what's happened over the past year has been exceptional. The amount of dollars that have been printed and currencies around the world that have been printed to keep economies afloat has been unprecedented, way larger than anything we saw in the 2008-2009 financial crisis. And I think that this, at the margin, is leading to an erosion in trust in uh, paper currencies. Now, I don't think that Bitcoin is the end game, but I think that we are moving in that direction where people are looking for alternatives. And the Bitcoin surge this year is just one sign of that, that we may think that there are no alternatives because we think in linear way, uh, the euro, the yuan, those will be the alternatives, just like in the past, the reserve currencies were always replaced by one currency after another. Before mm -hmm. the US dollar, it was the British pound. Uh, before that, it was the French currency, and the Dutch currency, and the Portuguese, and the Spanish, and so and so forth. But this time, something different is afoot. Right. And I think that the Bitcoin surge is a sign of that. Rushir, but in these countries where, where it's money is being printed there is someone doing the printing there is a central bank that is in control of these price levels and the amount of supply in the system i mean bitcoin uh, for all of it, it's all it's overcome in the last several years i mean it still has no global cop on the beat it still is mined from a computer it still could bankrupt someone's account uh, from a simple technological hack so how do you think that this is a long-term sustainable alternative uh, for someone who loses trust in, say, uh, a government-backed currency uh, to put everything in Bitcoin as an alternative? Yeah, I think that the biggest story here is blockchain technology. So that is what's really led to the rise of Bitcoin. And it's amazing. You talk about these trust levels. What I find so fascinating is the demographic divide out here. They speak to the millennials and the younger uh, population and they are have a lot of trust in Bitcoin and the way it is controlled, its supply is controlled. But a lot of the older folks are very skeptical of that. But my point is a bit different here, which is the Bitcoin is just a sign.
that something is afoot and the blockchain technology could lead to an alternative out here. Now the end game may be very different. We may move to some sort of a modern barter system where you don't even need a currency to trade just because blockchain technology allows for things to be fractionalized and for exchange to take place. So Bitcoin is a product of that. Uh, but I think that this is all a sign that if you print so much, there will be an alternative. And that's, I think, what's coming through with this Bitcoin surge. And remember, this is still very early days. The total sign of the cryptocurrency market is still only half a trillion dollars. Gold, which is always seen as a traditional hedge, the size of that market is $12 trillion or so. So these are still very early days, but I think that this is a shot across the bow, that there are consequences of printing yourself um, in such a large way.